Hi, my name is Virginia Wilson, Compliance Contract Officer with the County of Riverside Purchasing and Fleet Services Department. Welcome to part two of our four-part series on doing business with Riverside County. Hi, I'm Rod Jaffe. Throughout the video, we'll be asking four questions. Please pay close attention. Okay, who has applied for the county? Has anyone ever applied for the county for any kind of funding? Okay, a couple of people. One thing you're gonna notice on here, when you see a request for a proposal, you're, you have different range of motion, uh, motion. So like on public purchase, which is the county's website, you're gonna see the proposal that says, I can apply for that, and you're gonna be happy, because you say, I can get that funding. Then you're going to look at this, and you're gonna say, you know, I need to crunch this in, I needed to get it done, because the deadline's approaching fast for this proposal to be sent in. And then you're going to say, ah, oh, I finally got the dang thing in. I'm, oh, I'm happy and everything. Now I just got to wait on it. And then you're going to say, uh-oh, wait a minute. Did I include this piece? Oh, my gosh. I send it in. I don't remember everything I included in. I should have included this. I should have included that. You feel a little guilty about what you did. And then you start stressing. It's been a couple weeks. You don't hear anything. You're going crazy. Why doesn't someone say something to me, you know? And then... Finally, when the announcement comes, and if you get it or you don't get it, you're in shock. You don't know what to do. You, if you didn't get it, you're like, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? Or if you did get it, it's like, oh my God, what did I do right? You know, so you got either emotion. And the last one is you're totally in denial that you did the whole thing in the first place. So that's, the, so that's kind of the range of emotions in the RFP process. So first of all, um, we're going to understand terms and components of the bid. We're going to show you why you need to do this. We're going to really understand costs, and we're going to keep your preparation to a minimum. And we're going to do some secrets. So uh, first of all, definitions. These are really important. Uh, the county does a number of different definitions, and you've probably seen that if you've done anything. They have something called the RFI, which means Request for Information. Now, this will not get you a contract with the county. I'm going to let you know right now, this will not get you. If you answer this, it will not get you a contract. What has happened is we have a requesting party in the county, someone who doesn't know what they want. Let's say, uh, I recently did this because we wanted uh, an IT group to come in and do this, but we couldn't find any similar process out there. So what we did is we did a quest for information. We said, okay, here's what we want. Is there anybody out there that did this? And then we got several proposals back and everything. So yeah, we do this and it costs $10 million. We do this, it costs $100,000. And it's a wide range of processes. Usually they're sales brochures is what we get and stuff. But this will not lead you to contract. However, this will put you on the list when that item does get bid out. So it's always good to include, if you ever see a request for information and that um, is part of the, uh, what you're applying for, it's a good idea to, to apply for this because you, it could lead to getting a request to uh, actually contract for this item. So there's another one that we do too called uh, request for qualifications and I also it's called request for quote too. Now you're probably going to use the request for quote part. Request for quote generally means that um, We've sent an item out, we know exactly what we want, and you're gonna say, okay, I can do this item for this amount of money. And that's all, you don't have to propose because all that's written in there already. Because the county's telling you, this is how we're gonna do it, how much is this gonna cost us to do it? And that's all they're asking for. So that's a request for quote. A request for qualifications means, um, we got a uh, service, okay, one that we use, I work for social services, and we're a huge county department, we have like 4,000 employees, and we have, thousands of contracts. And one of the things we do is like we need to do adoption home studies. That's where we hire consultants to go out to the home and do a study if this home makes a good place for to place a child. Now, this is too much work. We have hundreds and hundreds of adoptions, so we'll do a request for qualification. Anybody qualifies to do that, we'll hire them. So you, uh, they'll have a minimum range of qualifications that we'll actually say in the the scope of information, but if you qualify, we'll do it. You don't see those these that much, but they are out there. Just want to make you aware. And the last one, which is probably the one that you're going to see most, is a request for a proposal. Now, a request for a proposal means we have a general idea of what we want with the county. We just don't know all the details. We want you to propose how you're going to perform this to us, how much is it going to cost us, and what kind of 
services and everything will be encompassed in this cost. And they're generally awarded to the bidder that meets all the requirements. And now there's some technicality about that, which I'm going to go into. But RFP is the one you're probably going to see the most. Okay, there's also, when you're doing the contracts, and the reason I'm doing the definitions first, and these are kind of important, is because you're going to see a lot of these whenever you do a contract with a county. These terms come out all the time, so I just want to share with you and go through them real quick. Addendum, that means you've applied to the county, your proposal's being considered, and we've said, you know what, we don't understand something about your proposal. We need to send you a clarification or an addendum to the proposal. Or it could also mean, too, that what happens is we put something in the proposal that wasn't clear, and then we posted an addendum to, uh, on the public's website so everybody can see that this is really what we meant. I understand the proposal wasn't clear, so this is what we're getting to. So that's what addendum means. It can mean a couple different things. An agreement or contract, these are terms are used interchangeably. They basically mean the same thing um, there, for any situation. So you're gonna, the, a proposal will lead to an agreement, a proposal will lead to the contract. It's the same thing. And then a bid, you hear this term a lot, it's the same as proposal, but it basically means you're offered to us, the county, in a bidding process. And then the bidder, that's you. You're the person offering to us, so you're giving us the bid, so you're the bidder. Uh, contract, same thing. Contractor is the successful bidder who enters into a binding agreement with the county. So you then become the contract contractor, or sometimes it's known as the vendor, uh, if you have a contract, but for most intents and purposes, you're going to see it in most of our agreements and contracts and stuff as the contractor. And then the county means the county of Riverside, and, uh, which has administrative responsibility for this RFP. And okay, that's just me. That's because I do this presentation for uh, other law groups. So we, um, there's, we do a lot of services at DPSS, and I actually put them on the end of the PowerPoint, some of the ones we've done in the last year or so. Uh, multiple service award, multiple source awards means an in, infinite quantity uh, contract for more similar services. So we may make more than one award from an RFP. So proposal comes in, we got it, and we said, you know, there's three vendors here that look pretty good. We're going to award all three. That's the county's decision, depending on how that is. And we run across this a lot at DPSS because we do a lot of services and they're county-wide. And generally, the person on the east end of the county isn't serving the same as the west end of the county. So we'll award two different areas of the county. Uh, professional services generally means an attorney, physicians, architects, engineers, professional, technical science individuals, organizations possessing some kind of specialized training or expertise that the county needs. And that could be construction. That could be anything. Depends on what you're going for. Um, but we consider that a professional service. And proposal means the document submitted in response to the RFP. Now, um, so when we award, we don't always award for the lowest price. What we use is we uh, use a phrase called most responsive, responsible proposal. And that basically means we award to the person that conforms to the material aspects of the RFP. And it means that are not limited to price, quantity, or any other part, but they most best fit our need. Because there are organizations that we run across all the time who don't always meet our need and will lowball the bid just to get the lowest price. But our experience is, is that they don't pan out as contractors and we end up not using them a lot. So you've got to have a little more substance behind that RFP process. True or false? The county does not always award to the lowest cost of the RFP. It awards to the lowest, most responsible, responsive bidder. Services uh, means once you go to a contract, you're going to provide us the services, means the furnishing of labor, time, and effort by you, the contractor. And subcontractor, which, yay, <laughs> uh, means the individual firm or corporation having to, so you have won a contract with the county and you need to subcontract a point of this contract. Generally, that has to be spelled out in the RFP that you're going to use a subcontractor. Um, but when you get into that contractual relationship, the county may ask you, who are you using as your subcontractor? So, so they may ask that information for you. 
Okay, there's two sections of an RFP. There is a, there's something called the terms and conditions, and I know it's attached to you guys. Got these two documents right here. There's two of them. They're actually a little different. One's called the terms and conditions, and one's called uh, bidder proposal response attachment A. And we're going to hit the terms and conditions real fast. Um, these are the actual current boilerplates the county uses right now. And I included them in the back. I think they're in the back. Get there, they're back there, Virginia? Yeah, okay, they're in the back, yeah. Um, so I wanted to give you a copy of this to understand what you're looking at when you do a proposal. And it, I tell you, it looks intimidating when you first look at it, but it's really not. If you know kind of the secrets, which I'm going to go into, it's really not so intimidating and stuff. So. So the first thing is going to be the um, cover page. And this is what we, uh, for the terms and conditions, this is the cover page. And what it's going to do is going to list, and by the way, these will all be electronic on the public purchase website, but they will probably look exactly the way they appear here. Um, there's going to be a solicit solicitation number assigned to this um, by the type of organization that's soliciting that bid. If it's a countywide bid, it will probably be RIVCO. If it's for social services, we start off with DP for Department of Social Services. The rest of it, the ARC, that's kind of our internal business unit talk. But um, you will come up with some kind of identification. That's what you're going to use in all processes that are referred to in all processes of your response to an RFP with the county. And it's also going to have the contact information because the most people that respond will want to know, who do I contact if I have any questions? In most county departments, it will not be the person who this bid is intended for. So I'm social services, and this bid is intended for me, but the contact information, more or less, will be someone from Virginia's office, someone from county purchase that oversees the whole county, because they are the controllers of the bid process, not the individual department. So that's an important step to take, because we, can, we work with them to release the bid, but once the bid is released, they are controlling part of the bidding process. What we do is we lend our expertise because they don't have the expertise sometimes to follow the bid. So that contact information is important because that's what you're going to refer to if you have any questions. And then on the, the next page, there's a table of contents, which I'm not going to go into too much. And there's going to be some attachments to this in the back. Now, all of our bids have um, a copy of our contract boilerplate attached to it in the back. So we don't want any surprises for you. So at the time that you're proposing, we want you to see the county's terms and conditions. Now, I didn't include a copy of that because it's another 30 pages you guys didn't need. But it, you'll see it in there. Um, Recently, we had a grant award with someone for half a million dollars. And we were going to award to them. And they did not look at the terms and conditions of the county, and they did not want to abide by our county terms, which a lot of them are non-negotiable. And we laid it out for them. And guess what? They didn't take the half million dollars. Right, that sounds like a lot of money to throw away, but they did because they didn't read the terms and conditions of the county. Um, the second page is the third page, I should say page three on this one, is instructions to the bidder. These are just like little things you just need to know. I'm not going to go over them. There's too much here, but it talks about the disabled veteran uh, preference. It talks about uh, what's included with the contract, uh, 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 method of award, just a lot of different little things. So there's a general overview of the services requested. So if I'm requesting parenting, let's say, I'm going to say DPSS um, was, is looking for a vendor to provide parenting services in the county in the regional area of Western Riverside. And so then we'll have a little more um, information about what we're looking for is the touch parenting model or this parenting model or something like that. But there'll be a general overview at the very beginning. And then it'll also say, it will tell you what types of organizations we're looking to have a contract with. Now, that doesn't limit you. And I want you to know that you can apply. If you think this is something your organization can do, please apply. We may state certain types of organization, but that should not limit you from applying. Now, the, the next thing is the timeline. Uh, it's on uh, page five of that handout. Now, the timeline. It's significant because we want we stay as close as the timeline uh, as possible, but things happen in the bidding process. It's not always our um, 
our choice, but things happen. And sometimes those timelines get reverted a little. So uh, we'll generally tell you when it's going to be released. We'll tell you um, when it's going to close, and so you can somehow plan a little bit. We're going to tell you a little bit about the valuation time frames, how long it's going to take them to evaluate. Now, I'm going to say this with a little loose thread of thought here, because if you ever did a bid, you know that evaluation sometimes can get very complicated and stuff. I know Virginia's shaking her head. She's done a few with me before. And um, sometimes they don't all conform to those guidelines, but would you rather have them evaluate your bid for a longer period than a shorter period? That seems to me it would always be a preference. They're going to look at more in depth at what you're doing. And then the approval and award process. So depending on what type of approvals needed, we may have to go to the county board of supervisors for approval. In this county, if we bid something out and it's over $100,000, our county board of supervisors has to approve it. If it goes to the county board of supervisors, you could probably add a month to a month and a half onto that timeline because that's how long it takes to go through the internal, or bureaucracy, let's admit it. You know, we have problems, you know. It's, it's slow pace getting through the system to post something on the county board's agenda. It takes a while. And so there, that award, well, if we can do it, we'll do it. But if it has to go through the board, we may end up saying we have a preliminary award, but it's not approved until the Board of Supervisors approves it. And then one thing that we also list on here is a pre-bid um, conference. So you'll have to look at that because sometimes we don't do a pre-bid conference. Sometimes we'll just say, please write in your questions. Because what happens, I found out, and I've attended a lot of these, is that when you get to the bid conference and someone says, ah, da, 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 and you're going, what? That bid, that question is too long and too complex to go into to answer just then. I'm going to have to write it down, and then I'm going to have to put a an, uh, writing answer to it and post it on the website saying these are the answers to the bids questions at the bidders conference and everything because what we find out is those questions are very sometimes very technical in nature and we don't always have an opportunity to answer them there on the spot. So you may not get a bidders conference. We just may ask you please send in your questions. But it will tell you that right on there. The last line here occasionally and I've run across this lately there is a pre-qualification process. Not all county departments do this, but some county departments say, if you don't come to the pre-bid conference, then you can't bid on this contract. Also, another thing you're going to see in here, too, is the length of the contract. You're going to see, um, is there going to be one year with three option years that we can sign for? Most of the time, the, the county prefers to exercise its options here. We're, we, once you become a vendor with us, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, we want to be your partner. I've, we've always had this approach, at least when I've been in charge. We want to be your partners. We don't want to throw away your business. So if we're going to have a one-year contract with option years, our choice is to exercise those option years with you. We want a multi-level, down-the-road contract to have a business partnership because it's really hard to do a contract for one year because half that year is just trying to get started. You know, So it's, it's tough. So general definitions, I kind of went over, but there's going to be some additional definitions in the contract, and the, I mean, in the RFP. And, um, and we also want to, and here there's also things like the evaluate. What are you going to be evaluated on? That's usually spelled out in this first part, the terms and conditions. Um, there's also, like I said, evaluation measurements. OK, your cost is going to weigh 30%. This is going to weigh this percent. Sometimes that is spelled out there, too. If not exactly um, in that fashion, it will actually have some kind of measurement. And um, you, the, there will be rules in there, the evaluator's rules, and how, how, what kind of rules will apply to the evaluation process will also be listed in there. I know I'm going fast, but we got, got a lot to go through. <laughs> Identify general rules for submitting a bid. The general proposal, which is um, uh, and to the towards the back. And you know, one of the other things back here, too, is the county's rights and the bidder's rights. That's all in the terms and conditions. Also, too, we may 
to have specific instructions on there and how to, if you want it, if we want it faxed, we want an email, we want a hard copy, we want CD, we want a binder, we want a Word, we want a PDF. All that stuff will be spelled out in the terms and conditions. And you have to look at that because it's not the same all the time. It changes depending on what the service is. And then there's always confidentiality agreements. There's always a, a clause that's going to say it's going to lead into a contract. I know with us, in my agency, we have HIPAA and PI compliance. So you have, we'll make you sign something. It's called the Business Associate Agreement for HIPAA. It says you're going to agree to HIPAA compliance and all this stuff. And PI is professional uh, or personal um, information. Um, so if you're serving clients or something, you may have to sign a PI agreement with us too. Um, and also things like RFP cancellation, but read everything carefully. I mean, it's too much to go into now in detail, but take your time, read it when it does come across your desk. Okay, the second attachment, A, is the proposal. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, we're still in terms conditions. Um, indicates how submitting should be prepared. Uh, stipulates who must sign this agreement. So I'm really talking about, um, but there's a section here that says, okay, it has to be signed by a officer of the company, owner, or whatever. That means you can't have your grant preparer sign it. If they're, because a lot of organizations hire people to apply, do this process. You can't have them sign. It has to be an authorized agent of your organization. Page 91. Okay, page nine. Okay, so that's, I just wanted to go over that real fast. And also, there's more information in there how many copies. Generally, in my organization, we ask for five copies. Some will ask for seven, some will ask for three. It depends. Um, so you got to read that uh, spot. And also, 99% of the time, you're going to be sending it to the county purchasing's main office in Washington Street. There's very rarely, is there any exception to that rule? But if there is an exception, you need to look at it because it would be listed at the very back. Okay, so the next session is the bidder's proposal. So there's a checklist here which has some general instructions about how you're gonna write up this proposal. So this is really the area that you're really gonna focus on how your bid package is gonna look. You're gonna have general instructions that tells you how, what it's gonna look like. There's a checklist usually, I'm looking at the second, this one right here, attachment A, I'm on page two. There's gonna be a second section there on checklist acknowledgement. And there's some attachment guidelines. So if you have attachments, it's going to tell you, how does, what do you want those to look like? I'm going to tell you, we, this year we had 80, 90 requests for proposals. And when you get that many, and every, we have as many as 20 responses for proposals, they start looking the same after a while. And so one of the things is, if you don't follow the instructions on how to put the attachments and all that stuff, you stand out, but it also could tell you too, you didn't follow the instructions, you're not gonna consider it for the proposal. And so you gotta read these, this stuff. It, it takes time, but you gotta read it. Well, we have um, had people that did not follow the instructions at all, and they were dropped out of the proposal process. Also it tells you how to present your cost and financials. And some uh, general rules uh, and the due date of the proposal and so forth. Also, uh, this is on page four. We'll have a little section here that you'll have to fill out and everything. This is a signature that's saying, this is usually the cover page of your bid. Um, and I'm going, like I said, I'm going really fast. So um, you need to know what goes on uh, on that cover page and everything because there's a lot of information that you need to put on there. And that will be the first part of your proposal journey. It says, I, Rod Jaffe, I'm applying this proposal. Here's the date. Here's my signature. Um, this is my organization and everything. And then all your contents usually behind it. We usually ask, as part of every bid, a company profile. What's your legal name? Are you a nonprofit, 501c3? Are you a corporation? Are you just a legal entity that's solo? You're working off of your social security number. What is your legal organization called? We're gonna ask a little bit about your history, um, anything that you have. If you're a big organization, you're probably gonna have a lot. If you're a small organization, you're probably not gonna have that much. You can just type something up and just include it. We're also, if you have a mission statement, we're gonna ask for that. 
We're going to ask them some general experience. I've been in business five years. I've done A, B, C, D, and F. I've worked with these companies and stuff. Um, and we're going to ask for your experience with government. We're going to say, I, you know, a lot of organizations we deal with are, believe it or not, not from Riverside County. We get a lot of bids thrown into us from counties all around Southern California. So they may say, I've worked with LA County on this and this. I've worked with, you know, uh, Sacramento County. I've done this, this, and this. And then any, if it's required, any credentials or resumes. Um, so credentials and resumes are basically a pretty standard thing if you're providing a service that needs it. Obviously, if you don't provide a service that needs credentials and resumes, it will have, it'll probably be removed or they'll be said, this does not apply. And something that we're going to ask, you don't have to share with us, but we'll find out if you've ever been part of the federal exclusion list. Because what we do on all of our bids and all of our contractors, we do run the federal uh, website and everything to see if you have ever been disbarred from getting federal funds or anything like that. We've hardly ever run across, I mean, the thousands of companies we deal with, it's only been one or two that is actually, and they were really old, like 2001, 19, 1999 and stuff. And, but um, we, still make, we can still make a decision to go that route anyway. Um, Clarifications, exceptions, or deep. So you look at the RFP and you say, I can't do this. I don't have this insurance requirements. I'm just a single guy running this company and everything. I can't meet these requirements. So what this area is is where you say, I can't meet the bid or the contract with the county or the proposal because of these reasons. But I'm going to propose anyway. This does not eliminate you from the bid, but it may, when we, if you do, are considered a winner, then we may have to sit down and negotiate this part with you. Now, some organizations, like recently we ordered 1,000 iPhones for my organization and Verizon was the bidder. Their whole, co my, our whole boilerplate was exceptions and deviations. I mean, it was, their, their copy of exceptions was 40 pages long. <laughs> so, and they still got the win. <laughs> they still got the bid and everything. I mean, AT&T was up again, T-Mobile, all these other companies up again, but they still got it. So it doesn't mean you're not going to get a contract. Be honest with us. If you can't meet terms of the bidding or the contract, tell us up front. And it does not exclude you from being a winner of the proposal, but at least we know where you stand and we can work with you on it. We're going to ask for evidence of insurance. Now, obviously, you probably won't have evidence of insurance of our contract at time of the bid. We'll ask for it after you get awarded. We'll, we'll send you a letter saying, you know, we'll need your evidence of insurance and blah, blah, blah. But I know with my shop, um, we actually have a whole database we track this on. I know uh, Jeffrey Hunter is going to be one of the presenters here, and he'll go a lot into the insurance natures. Jeffrey's really good. He, um, he, he can do a lot with you. Um, he'll do things like he can even, if you don't have insurance, he'll can steer you towards nonprofit sites and other things that are low cost insurance. And so he's really good. He works for the county. Okay, here's the name, main gritty uh, point of the RFP, uh, RFQ, or whatever it's going to be. It's the scope of work. Now, you'll notice with our scope of work, they're going to be drop down boxes. We have these boxes, and it's going to say something like provide your company's mission statement if, it's, if we have your company. Or it's going to be something like, what does your service do? And it's either going to be a couple different things. Either you're going to type something up and put it in that box, you're going to make an attachment and put it in that box, or it's going to, the question is going to say, do you acknowledge that the county is going to do this? And it'll just ask, for, or do you acknowledge that your company does this? And it'll just ask for a signature. That's all it will do. But there's, as you can see in the, um, in the spot, and it's, you can't hardly see it's red line, but you, there's these boxes, and that's really what we're looking for in the bidding process, to drop the information into these boxes. And again, it's all online, so it's really, really easy to do. However, if you have a lot of attachments, there is special instructions in the bid to say, okay, attachment A goes to this box, attachment B goes to this box, and stuff like that. So you need to read that. So that's what I'm talking about, bidder's response box. It's going to, you know, there could be statements outlining your specific services or other information. Uh, there's a signature, proposal, attachments, read carefully and answer, do not leave blank. Don't leave them blank. Whatever you do, do not leave them blank. Even if it says, does not apply to me, put that in there. Because if you leave them blank, we're going to probably send it back to you and say, hey, you left something blank. Did you intend to leave this blank? And you'll probably, that will hold up the proposal and everything else too. 
So we're also going to talk about uh, uh, references. If you're a new, but all we're looking for are a couple of references. Um, depending on how complicated the bid is, you may ask for more than a couple references. With us, we do not want you using the county, us, let's say I've done business with you before. We don't want you using us as the reference that we're proposing to do. We're, we're preferring that you use someone else besides us. But we get, we get people sending bids in that say, yeah, Rod, you're my reference. And I go, no, 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 no. I'm the guy giving you the money. I can't be your reference. So we, don't, we can't have that. So you need to get someone that's ex external, uh, mostly to your bidding process. Um, also, too, there's a, uh, if, you, if you have any issues with the contract, it's going to list what you think those issues are in here. It's a little box. Uh, again, more company profile information. Then when it comes to costs, we're going to put everything in a sealed, we want you to put your cost system in a sealed envelope. Now, there are lots of things when it goes to cost. God, I could do a whole hour on cost because this is where usually people mess up on. You guys know what you do. You know, that's not the point. You know, so when you fill out those boxes and you drop in your services and stuff, that's the easy point. Cost is where people mostly mess up at. Because with the county, they could be requesting a lot of different things. They could be asking for a line item budget. They could be asking for a unit of service. Does anyone here know what a unit of service is? So a unit of service means I have a line item budget um, Da, 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 my travel expenses, my payroll, my building overhead, copying, um, you know, office staff, blah, 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 blah. And it comes to a bottom line. And what happens in the proposal, we told you, okay, we're going to serve 3,000 clients. And you're going to say, okay, based on that, that total, we're going to divide it into the number of clients. And so my cost is going to be $122 a unit. So the instructions will be very simple. We do, here at DPSS, we do a lot of unit of service because it's easier. And I tell you why it's easier. Is everybody listening? Okay. With a line item budget, because we're a federal or a state agency, or a county agency that gets state and federal money, we're going to ask you for everything. That, that gas receipt you got at Chevron, we're going to want to see that. That um, rent check, we're going to want to see that. We're going to ask you, your documentation each month is going to be this high alone if we're asking for a line item budget. It's enormous, and it's what we have to have because we claim back to the state that money. We say, okay, here's what we got, and then we claim to say it. So like my agency, we're two years in the rear. We're still getting reimbursed the services we delivered to two years ago that we claim back to the state. That's how far the state is. And even though we're Social services is a $2 billion organization. We're still waiting on our reimbursements in 2012. <laughs> we haven't got them yet. So we front a lot of that money as we, as we go on and stuff. But if the state doesn't get the information, they will not reimburse us. So my fiscal department is hell on wheels, and they will drive you crazy for that information. So. Why am I saying this? Because if you have a unit of service and all this is factored in here, all you have to do is show us the client's name or the whatever you did that compiled that unit of service. A signature list from, you, you, I served 10 people. And you, here's my signature list. There's 10 units of service. And you just hand that to us and you're done. It's a lot easier and it's a, a lot better for everybody in our um, working with us and everything. Saves a lot of time and effort. So. Um, you got, well, those instructions will be spelled out in the RFP. Now, I can go let's talk a lot about this. I really don't have the time, but it's something you've got to look for. And here we go, line in the budget, unit of service. And you also, too, regardless, you've got to put a budget narrative in there. You've got to say, okay, my salary includes this, or my admin expense includes this. Because a lot of people say, um, we get a lot of proposals. I don't know if Virginia got this, where they said 20% overhead. And that's all they put. Well, I'm going to tell you, we're going to want to know what is that 20% overhead? What goes into that? Is it paper, copiers, uh, fax machines? You know, I need a laptop, whatever it is. You're going to, we're, going to need to want, we're going to want to know that for the proposal. So you need to look at that, and when you do your budget proposal of what goes into your costs, please include that type of detail. Okay, the last thing, on the, we're going to also ask for a financial statement. Now, financial statement is different than what your cost. A financial statement says, okay, in 2012-13, my organization did 
$50,000 and this is our audited audit numbers from our financials that day. We're going to ask for that. It, it, it will be in a separate envelope. It will be sealed. It's um, actually given to an external partner who actually runs the financials and scores them for us. It's usually an accountant or someone that we deal with all the time. And so we will ask that in our proposals. Uh, the reason we do that is because we do run a lot of, uh, across a lot of organizations that may not have the financial well-being to make it through the contract if they have to front up the cost. Because remember, you're getting reimbursed in the rears. You're going to be putting money up front. And a lot of companies, that's really hard. I'm working with one right now. This used to be a million dollar organization. They really had some hard times and they're, they have a contract with us and they're actually asking for cash advances and stuff because they don't have enough money to be payroll right now. So those are the type of things we want to try to avoid. So we're going to want to see your financials. It's not public records, kept confidential in a sealed envelope. It, once the, it's, uh, the score is returned to the sealed envelope and kept with the bid package, which is stored at Virginia's office, and Virginia, will, anybody messes with uh, those things, they mess with Virginia. So, <laughs> True or false, the financials and the cost proposal must be in a separate sealed envelope when you submit your proposal. Okay, some other things to talk about when preparing your bid package. The, there's checklist. Make sure your checklist that you include, that's according to the instructions, is very clean. Use page numbers. Nothing frustrates an evaluator more than trying to figure out where things is in the bid. They say, I think that's on page 22 and there's no page number and they got it out of order. Now they can't find it. And, you know, Use page numbers. It's, it sounds small, but boy, is it a big thing when it comes to evaluations. Follow the instructions 100%. If you don't uh, agree with the instructions, you have questions about the instructions, get a hold of the contact information and ask them. It's usually a, per, a representative from county purchasing, and they will assist you. They'll, they'll email them. You can talk to them on the phone. Generally, I've never, ever had a problem getting hold of them. So they'll follow instructions if you don't know what's going on, um, on as far as specific instructions. Uh, so as I said earlier, bids can be disqualified for not following all the rules. It doesn't happen that often, but in, I, in our lifetime, I know I've had a few of them that did. Um, in fact, when you worked for me, didn't we have some of them that were disqualified and stuff? Yeah, so we've had some disqualified and stuff for not me meeting the guidelines. I mean, these are pretty bad. I mean, they didn't even look at the instructions at all. They just kind of whipped something together and gave it to us. What we do is usually when the bid comes in, and we may get 15 bids, and we will have a checklist to say, okay, did they include this? Did they include this? You know, just the basic outline of what they were asked to give. And so the first thing we're going to do is say, okay, did they meet these basic, the basic request of the bidding process? Did they meet this? And, you know, generally, um, most people do. We do get occasionally, they're going to be left up. You won't get disqualified for leading off a document or this document. We may, depending on your bid, we may call you and say, you left off this document. Did you attend on doing that or did you want to give it to us now? So be sure you look at that. Each uh, process also is going to have a cover page, which we already talked about. It's going to be signed by whoever is authorized in your organization. Um, there's usually right after that, there's a letter of introduction. You know, you can throw other things. The, I, I want to be clear about this. The bid package, there is things that have to be in it. But if you have a little bit a nice little letter that for your introduction telling you who you are and what you're doing and stuff, I would include it. It does, may not say that in the instructions, but I would include it anyway. So again, um, and the, these are, this is in the actual bid package yourself. All these tabs are the tabs relating to the bid package that you're going to be proposing. Uh, again, you're going to have a, a company profile that tells you who you are, it, what we're doing there is establishing you as an entity that's proposing for this item, and it's going to show your ability, your experience, and stuff like that. And again, this will, this will if you follow the bid package, this will fall right down inside the big package. And then uh, we're going to have a, a current copy of your business license if you have one. If you don't have one, is it going to stop you from being considered? No, it won't stop you, but we may ask for it later on. Um, it's a lot of people um, don't have they 
I want to say this nicely, they neglected to get their business license. So we will help them if they're still considerate. We're not going to, you know, take you guys down because you didn't have a business license, but we will assist you and try to get that business license for you and stuff. So tab D has acknowledgments, um, you know, uh, say, yes, I acknowledge I'm this person and this is a source, clarifications to the bidding process, exceptions, deviations, just like that Verizon example I gave. You want to put all those in there under tab D because, you know, when you respond to this, you, you just got to say, I don't, I d can't agree with this, say, or maybe I can't follow, I can't get a million dollars professional liability for this service or whatever it is. It's going to cost me too much money. It's not even worth it. It's only a $3,000 contract and you're asking for a million dollars. You know, those type of things. You got to, you got to let us know that. Um, there also is some non-negotiable terms in the contract. Um, and you got to be aware of that. And again, I didn't bring a copy of a boilerplate contract with it, but you just got to be aware that there's some non-negotiable terms in there. And there's some certification signatures that say, okay, your name has to be on the bottom, whoever's uh, supplying that. And I, I think some of those are in this boilerplate, but just be look out for them. Tab E, there's a, that's where you're going to put your main description of your scope of services. You're going to say, how you're meeting the requirements, any work plans. It says how you're going to do this. If we ask for outcomes, how you're going to meet those outcomes, how we're going to assess those outcomes, uh, quality assurance, how you, what process internally you're going to use to check back to make sure county's uh, contracting requirements are being met, um, what I'm going to give you as far as reports, um, uh, and if, if more and more for us, anyway, evidence base, you know, there are clearinghouses in the state of California that says if you provide this service, then it has to be evidence based. That means your service is a proven model. It's been proven in other parts of the United States or in California. Now, there, you can actually go on, the, there's a website, and I didn't include it in here, the state of California, where you can go on and it lists all these evidence based models, and they may uh, be the service you're providing and stuff like that. If you can get that information, that really helps you a lot in the bidding process because that means that whatever service you're providing is a proven model and um, and it we are looking for proven models it helps a lot okay and tab F is references and um, which may depending on regulations again our funding here from my organization two billion dollars worth a year comes almost all from federal and state. We don't use hardly any county funds whatsoever. So federal and state are going to have some requirements the county may not have and stuff. Most departments in the county use a percentage of county funds. We don't use very many. So again, you got to read that part because it will tell you I need five uh, years worth of uh, completion of projects I worked on and stuff. If you don't have it, say I only have this. It'll still, probably, it'll still be accepted. You're not going to get penalized for it. So again, like I talked about, don't list references from, you're applying to me, my, part of my organization. Don't put Rod as your reference because um, I'm not your reference. I'm, I'm a nice guy, but I'm probably not going to be your reference. Um, also, missing information, like I said before, boxes that are incomplete, that raises red flags to the evaluators. And you are going to want that information in there. Even if it's, say, not applicable, put it in there anyway. Put something in there. Tab I is your financial information. Again, this is in a sealed envelope. Uh, you want to get it as most recent, but we're okay with going back three years and uh, going, say, let's say your last financial statement was 1011. We want something newer, but we'll take 1011 if that's all you have. Okay, and again, with the financials, we want at least one full year. And then tab H is uh, the cost proposal. We also want that sealed separate from the, you know, most of our bids come in a binder or something, but we will take online a lot of times. Um, however, or the ones that come in a binder, we do want your costs separate in a sealed envelope. It can be st stuck inside the binder. We just want it separate and outside of it, we want to label cost proposal and everything. Because those are not scored usually by the valuation team. They're scored independently from the valuation team on most cases. The valuation team is really... Um, doing your ability to deliver these services. They're not actually looking at the cost of the service. They're saying, okay, based on all the criteria we set forth, can this person deliver the services we spec'd out? And then the cost portion is a different portion that gets factored in at a letter day. And when, when we do this together, it's all brought together with the evaluators and everything. Um, 
there's just exactly what I just said. Um, and then insurance requirements. Again, um, you're going to have, you stay with this program, you're going to have Jeffrey Hunter talking about the insurance requirements with our contracts. He's going to do a whole thing on it. I won't go on enough. We track it. We have a special software we use at DPSS to track all of our insurance requirements. Um, we actually call, if you don't have them, we will call the broker for you if you have a broker, and we will work with the broker to make sure they say what they need to say and all that stuff. So you got to have commercial liability if you're driving a vehicle, vehicle liability, but we put an if statement in your contract if you drive a vehicle. If you don't drive a vehicle, you don't need vehicle liability. Uh, waiver, subrogation, uh, we're workers con. Um, and on your accord form, does anybody know what accord form is? You have they, the county of Riverside needs to be listed as additionally insured. And you know, a lot of times people don't know what that is, so we will assist you on that. I know my staff do. We actually call the broker and have them add it and everything. Okay, RFP secrets, because this is what you really need to know. <laughs> what are the secrets into preparing an RFP? So let's discuss some of the things we just talked about in the proposal package. So you're going to have a checklist. You're not going to be able to do that until you actually get your RFP awarded, or prepared, I should say. You're going to have a cover sheet. You can't really do that ahead of time. You've got to wait until you're actually filling out the proposal to do that. You're going to have your table of contents. Again, that's something you can't really do in advance until you get, you're get ready to finish up the RFP proposal. But there are things that you can do now, while you, after you leave this room today, that you can have ready to go when you do propose. You can have a company profile. You don't need to wait to the RFPs release for that. You can start putting that together now and just make an attachment to the RFP. You probably already have some kind of evidence of insurance. It may not apply to your proposal, but that's okay. But as long as you can prove that you have some evidence of insurance, that's all you need. And you can get that now. You don't have to wait till you're proposing for the county. If you have a license, a, um, if you need to be licensed, a contractor's license, a resume certification, a, like if you're a licensed clinical social worker or whatever it is, you probably already have that information too. You don't have to wait till the bids release to get that information. You probably already have it. So these are items that you ha could get ahead of time and just have ready. So you're going to save a lot of your time instead of waiting till the last minute to prepare your bid to have this stuff ready to go. Financial information. Uh, as we talked about, you can use one of your prior financial statements, have that all ready to go, put it in a sealed envelope, it's done. You're basically ready. And your credentials, resumes. Um, if, you're, if, it's, if it's something that's asked for in the RFP process, then you're, if you can get that prepared ahead of time, it shouldn't be a problem. Sometimes if you're adding more onto it, you may need more, but for now, it's, it shouldn't be a problem. So the things that you're not going to be able to prepare ahead of time is your description of services. If you can get it into format that you can drop it in the box, great. But most of the time, what's going to happen is you're going to have to follow the instructions of the RFP, and it's going to take a little while to put that together into the RFP request. Your references, you could get your references ahead of the uh, RFP. Have them all ready to go. These are things that, you know, we're talking about, you know, at least half the RFP requirements you can have before you even start the RFP. The cost proposal, now you probably wouldn't be able to do this ahead of time because you don't know for the RFP, you don't know how much money is being awarded. And the RFP might not even say how much money is being awarded, but you're probably going to propose based on your scope of work that you're proposing to the county is going to tell you how much it's going to cost. Out of the 11 items asked, six items can be completed before you. That's 58%. Therefore, focus on the five items that need to be uh, customized to fit the framework of your RFP. If you look at it that way, you're only focusing on what you really need to focus on. You're not focusing on all this other stuff that you probably already have now. It's a good way to look at the RFP process. It can get kind of complicated. All right. Thank you, guys. My name is Rita Medellin. I will be covering how to identify what is a public works form as defined by the State Contractors License Board. I will share with you the bidding requirements for public work projects, the bidding limits for public works projects, and when prevailing wage rate applies. Can I just have a show of hands? Who's in the construction field here? Okay, great. Good. Um, and after I'm done, if there's a, 
specific issue that you want to discuss that I didn't discuss, please feel free to come and talk to me afterwards and I'll be able to help you. Okay, let's start off with defining a public works. Is there any improvement, repair, or remodeling to public owned land or buildings? Example would include painting, installing cabinets, re-roofing, contract, concrete work. Bottom line, when you have to hire a contractor, that is considered public works. Okay, let me help you identify public works. We have a HVAC system in the county admin building that needs to be replaced. It's not when you're planning, it's not when you're engineering, it's not when you're designing. That is professional services. That's what Rod was talking about. So all those RFPs apply to that top one. Then you have the work done, you hire a contractor firm to come. This is considered public works. You're done with your project and now you have your ongoing maintenance. Ongoing maintenance repairs is not. This is considered public works. This is what I will be talking about today. In order for a contractor to perform work for the county of Riverside, they must meet the following requirements. You must have been selected through the proper bid process, and we'll talk about that in a bit. You have to be properly licensed by the state of California for that trade that we're calling out for. If your project exceeds $1,000, you are required to pay prevailing wage rate if you hire employees. You must carry workman's comp, liability insurance. What Rob talked about, the business license, that does not apply here, okay? You can have a business license from San Bernardino. We don't care as long as you're properly licensed by the state of California. And then one thing you must do is when you're going through the bid process, you have to sign the county public works form, which you're going to have to do, which states that you were adhered to the county's terms and the conditions. Those are the five things that you must do to do work for the county. Bidding requirements. Any bids under $999, bids are not required. I could guy, find one guy and I could go directly to him as long as he's licensed and he doesn't require bonds, okay? 1,000 to 25 to, to 24,999. I, as a project manager, have the ability to call three bidders that hold the right trade, get them in, I select the low bidder, purchasing will issue the PO, bonds are not required. Okay, 25,000 to 175,000, that is formal bidding that is gonna go out to central purchasing. So in other words, I can't handle those bids. So that will go out to the central purchasing department who will monitor the bid process and issue the purchase order. Performance bond, payment bond, bid bond are all required, okay? Anything over 175 is above our limit. It has to go through the Board of Supervisors and the Clerk of the Boards. They monitor the bid process and bonds are required. Central purchasing is not involved in that dollar limit whatsoever. True or false? Public Works bids over $175,000 will need Board of Supervisors approval. Okay. So I'm just telling you, zero to 999, prevailing wage rates do not apply. Who monitors the bid process? Bids are not required for that low dollar. And where are the RFQs posted? It's not required for that dollar amount. And I'm just going exactly down, down the road. What I do want you to know is when it goes to central purchasing, they advertise on their website, they have to buy law, and they also advertise with these plan rooms here. And those are on your list. So any projects between 25,000 and 175,000, you will find on their website. And if you work with those plans rooms, they should be automatically giving you a copy of that RFQ, okay? Anything over 175, the clerk of the board will go ahead and they will advertise in the newspapers. But let me get five people up here to help me really quick. I have examples for you that I'm gonna run by you. Somebody read this and said it was a little confusing. So I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. Co-owner, if I can get you to go down, she's gonna be here by herself. Okay, let's start with number one on your last page. This woman here owns her own construction company. She is going to self-perform. She was low bid, she's gonna self-perform, have no one else help her. She doesn't have to pay prevailing wage rate, okay? Example number two, co-owner, are you co-owner? Yes. yes, and her brother, Okay, and her brother from another mother. <laughs> These are co-owners, okay? 
she is going to self-perform the work with the other owner. So they're both performing. They're not going to hire anybody else. They don't have to pay prevailing wage rate, okay? Because they're going to take a profit. Now you are, now if I get you to go over, okay. Now, she owns the company. You've been demoted. Okay, <laughs> hold that right there. Okay. She owns a company and decides she can't do it herself, so she hires her brother to come help her. She is required to pay him prevailing wage rate. Just that simple. Okay? She owns a company. She has to hire the subcontractor who hires her workers. She is required to pay them prevailing wage rate. Once you write that check because you hire somebody, you have to pay prevailing wage rate. It's just that simple. And most local government and government projects, if you're doing construction and it's over a hundred, it's over a thousand dollars. If you hire employees, you have to pay prevailing wage rate. It's just that simple. I have on here a website for the state's website. You can go on there and that'll tell you exactly what the prevailing wage rate is for certain counties and certain trades. It's mostly for contractors. So it's not for personal and professional services. It's, is for contractors and once again any projects I, I want to just let you know we have contract we have workers out there calling us and say hey we're not getting paid any prevailing wage rate by this contractor so we refer them to the board and then they my job is to get the contractor to sign and say I will pay my employees prevailing wage rate that's how I protect the county so when they're not getting paid, we refer them to the right agency and they go after the contractor. So before I answer questions, want to make sure any project over 1,000, we can request certified payroll at any time. Certified payroll is always required for projects that exceed 25,000. Okay, thank you. Thank you. or false. Writing plans for a construction project falls under the Public Works RFQ. Um, so I just have a quick little story about this and how uh, ethics works and everything. Um, I grew up in Huntington Beach, but a lot of my family was from Missouri. And we would go back to Missouri all the time during uh, the summer, spend practically the whole summer there and everything. You know, I, I, this is them to a T. You know in Beverly Hillbillies where Jed's shooting the ground and oil comes up and everything? They live next door, my family, you know? I mean, they, my family was old school, I'm telling you. And so what happens, we used to go back there. When I was like 10 years old, um, my mom, we had, all had BB guns, all had BB guns. And my mom said, you can't use your BB gun because you're going to poke an eye out, you know, just like the Red Ryder BB gun in that TV movie and everything. And so we uh, had our BB guns and everything. Well, we're 10 year olds. We don't listen to mom, you know, so we snuck, me and my cousin snuck out of the house with our BB guns and we went out to hunt killer rabbits. And um, <laughs> these, uh, we were, dancing through the woods and you know, the, the woods back um, in, at least in uh, Ozark part of Missouri are really thick and everything, you know. It's, um, it's all dark canopy underneath, a lot of brush, a lot of snakes, a lot of things moving around and stuff. But as a kid, you don't care about those things. But I found an opening and finally we saw our first killer rabbit. And so I got the first shot at him and I sit there and I looked at the rabbit, I looked at the gun, I lined it up and everything. And the rabbit looked at me, it was pretty tough. And I pulled the trigger and shot him. Just as I shot him, he hopped and it hit a rock and hit me right above the eye right here. And I had this big, huge shiner. Of course, I fell back like this and the cousins that are with thought I was dead and they went ran off. They ran off to tell my mom and everything, you know. So my mom comes back and, and, and I start walking back and I got this little cut above my eye and I, got, I know I got to have shiner and everything. And so I'm walking back towards the house and I see my mom with like 10 other adults coming after me because they thought I was dead and everything, you know. And they come to me and go, what were you doing and everything? And I said, I shot my BB gun, you know. And she says, I told you not to do that and everything. Well, that's ethics. 
In a, a roundabout way, that's what ethics is. It's like the government tells you what not to do. We're trusting that you don't do it, you know? And that how that story relates to this. Um, so anyway, we have a code of ethics policy. Uh, this, isn't, this is something we hand out to every single evaluator who evaluates any of your proposals. It basically lists the, what the code is going to be and that there's any conflict of interest, they must sign off on it or ch and uh, disqualify themselves. So all evaluators sign something. I just want to let you know that they are held to the highest ideas on that. Um, Ethic tips are compliance with laws, regulations, policy, and procedures. Just becoming familiar with the laws, that's, that's a hard thing, but we try to do that. And it, it, ethics really transcends laws. Um, there's a big difference between what you have a right to do and what is the right thing to do. Because a lot of times is um, you'll have things you know that are the right thing to do, uh, but they might be the right thing thing to do. And there is a distinguished referee, Michael Josephin, who does a lot of um, ethics broadcasts and stuff, talks a lot about that. And you know, what, one of the things he always talks about is, um, uh, well, he has, a, he has a great little story, and I, another little story. And this, one, this is a short presentation, so. It's not really a story, it's more of a kind of a joke, but anyway. Uh, at a jury duty, he was at jury duty, and um, he hears the defense attorney goes up there, and the defense attorney said, Sir, aren't you the one that took all these bribes and everything? And he's pointing at the witness, and the witness is sitting there looking out the window, not paying any attention at all. And he goes, Sir, really loudly again, aren't you the one that took all these bribes? And the witness is just looking around, not answering the questions and everything. The judge finally gets up and says, Sir, you're going to have to answer the attorney's questions. The witness looks at the judge and says, oh, I thought he was talking to you. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a great another example of ethics, you know. Um, ethics, again, is doing the right thing. Um, avoiding conflicts of interest, actual conflicts, financial transactions, personal relationships. I, I do a longer class in this, and one of the things we use is examples like if my if I had a brother and my brother bid on a county contract and I was an evaluator, can I legally evaluate his contract and everything? Well, I see, you know, you might say, no, you can't because you're his brother. But what if I uh, did not have a financial interest in his company? I would not profit from his company. So, so there's a lot of gray there and you just, and you just got to know how to f funnel yourself around that gray. So personal relations, acceptance against future employments, appearance of kind. It's all about the appearance or perception. It doesn't mean you're actually doing anything. It's how you perceive stuff. Perception is reality. When it comes to trust, perception is reality. It's not enough to, to know, yeah, it's not enough to do no wrong. We also have to show that others believe we have done no wrong. Um, when you contract with the county, you're in a position of authority because basically, whether it's my name on my forehead says Rod Jaffe, account, government employee, or you're my contractor and it says your name, you're still going to be attached to me. So in public, I get, I'm going to tell you guys this, I get all the complaints from the general public. It has to do with social services, you know, when they come in and say, I saw a social worker driving 125 miles per hour on the freeway, doing, and they were driving on the shoulder, and then they went to the fast lane, and da, da, da. All those complaints come into me. And I, I say the same thing. You know, it's not if you really did it or not, it's the perception that you did it. It's perception in the public size. So as a contractor with the county, you may have no physical relationship with the county, but your perception that people think you do. And that's going to steer your business. And so you, that's, that's the big thing with this. Um, and then again, a government, it's the public trust and a fiduciary responsibility. Um, we, you, you are probably going to be, in most cases, uh, privy to confidential information. A lot of our uh, contractors are and stuff, you know. Not so much on the public works ones that Rita does, but especially if you do services. Services, we can't help it. We're, it's part of that service delivery is you're going to have access to information about people within the county and stuff. And you have a responsibility to keep that um, information 
private and you must have to, and there could be some controls on that, observing security protocols on that. You have to, may have decryption or something. Generally, that's for bigger contracts, but it's just part of the overall perception that you have to have something in place. Um, and there's the last line, remember, loose lips sink ships. I'm not even sure who said that. I think that was during World War II somebody World said War that. II. Yeah. <laughs> um, broadly, you have to have internal controls as a contractor. You have to know that the left hand is not doing different than the right hand, and so you guys are not clashing all the time. You have to have some kind of uh, compliance and efficiency with your operation. And you know you have to, everybody in your organization has to have a responsibility for those internal controls. And so every, when you do things, it's done in an ethical manner. Because that's what the county is really looking at. Um, your, your management environment has to have a uh, tone has to be at the top. So if you have employees, they're going to be looking to you. I know that goes on in this county. We look to our uh, management for those ethics behavior. You know, you guys saw Mr. Howdy Show today. Mr. Howdy Show is about as high up there as ethical behaviors. You ever going to meet anybody in your life, man? He is strong. He, if anything even has a close to perception, he's going to shut it down. And so he's one of those people you really want to look to. Um, and again, here's some more controls and as far as internal controls, what you need to do to control that environment. Now, I did want to put this in here. Because this is Government Code 1090, and a lot of lawyers will talk to you about this. Government 1090 is the law with a government code that it prosecutes a government employee or the contractor by violating the public's trust. And so um, even though it says who is responsible, it says public officer, board member, government employee, anybody who participates in the making of a contract, and that's you guys. If you if you got a purchase order, you got anything, you're participating in making of that contract. Any with knowledge or personal financial interest in the contract, so you have a personal financial interest. So if you get caught breaking the procurement rules by lying or deceiving or anything, this is the law that you will go against. Now, what is this law? Uh, oh, the other part of this is it constitutes the making of a contract, voting, participation, so forth. It's a felony now. It used to be a misdemeanor, but they increased it like three years ago to a felony. And state prison is probably, I don't want to scare anybody. <laughs> we have to deal with this law every single day. And, you know, uh, again, we hold ourselves to a higher ethical behavior. So we don't even think this applies to us, you know. But it's a $1,000 fine. Life, if you're a county employee, it's lifetime disqualification. Uh, state keeps the money and property from the contract. I mean, it really is pretty savage. So the other one is, okay, let's say it's a huge contract, it's a million dollar contract, well a thousand dollar fine is not very much money, he's going to use his million dollars to pay off that thousand dollar fine. So then they get you on this one, Penal Code 424, which basically says uh, anybody in charge with dispersing money as a vault of a public official or any public contract and everything is subject to penal resolution. And so basically this one says appropriates money without authority, loans or makes profit without money, and this is all dealing with government dollars. Now, I don't want to be a scare tactic, I'm just making you guys aware these laws exist and what you need to do and stuff. So, and it's anything falsifying accounts, concealing, anything thing like that. Uh, and this one, it's a felony conviction. It's actually, the prison term's a lot harsher. It's two to three to four years. Probation's three to five. There's a 10,000 fine. Now, the guy still made 990 million off of it, but you know, a $10,000 fine. Full restitution, that's what they can get you on this. Uh, disqualification, but here's the kicker. This last line, this was a change just this past couple years. So what this line right here means is that, let's say you contracted with the county in 2008, but you weren't discovered to 2014, and then the, the district attorney went after you, its statute of limitations is four years from when they went after you, not from when you did the offense or the contract. So you, this con, there's no statute of limitations practically on this offense. So you, they could go after you for anything, use of, misuse of public funds. So. Okay, so listen to the bells and whistles of uh, uh, ethical situations, uh, freebies, eh, you got to be careful about freebies. I know we, uh, we try to steer away from them in county purchasing as much as, um, as possible. Um, there's also uh, consulting fees or special loan deals, um, uh, using government resources to your advantage. Um, hiring relatives, well, in your private industry, business is yours, it's probably going to be okay. For us government employees, eh, it's probably not a good idea to hire my 
my sister's brother-in-law to do this half million dollar project, and it's going to probably raise a perception again. Uh, leaving government for a position with a contractor, this one probably goes on more than any of them because how many times you read in the paper where this guy left office and he's septing a prestigious with this big law firm or somebody like that, you know. So chances are they probably had their hooks in him before he was even left office, but we can't prove that. It's a perception. Um, and then political intervention, using political power to have contracts steered your way and stuff. Uh, avoiding illegal actions, um, just, just avoiding everything completely. Um, you want to, again, uh, uh, avoid the parents of wrongdoing and res resist short-term gains or wins for long-term expense, because you're probably going to ruin your relationship with the county forever. Uh, making tough but necessary decisions, time and fair the end. Anyway, just some th things to think about, and I appreciate your um, help on that. Thank you, guys. This concludes part two of our four-part series on doing business with Riverside County. We look forward to seeing you at our meet and greet with the buyers on Monday, September the 15th, 2014, where you will be able to put your new knowledge to work. Thank you and good luck.